like this right here. So five freaking years ago, oh my God, just mentioning penises over and over again does not an adult tone make. Well, hello. Welcome back to my channel. Just Shauna here to talk about some friggin' books that I've read recently or DNF'd recently. <laughs> I think there's just one DNF. Also, uh, don't mind, I don't know what's going on with this bun. I think it's fine. It feels weird, but also this like weird shirt situation. I got more work done on my sleeve, my half sleeve. So I can't have uh, fabric on it. And my arm is all red right here because I had um, the like second skin, like derm shield, like second skin they call it, that like sticks to your skin for a few days. I got, this was this past Thursday, today's Monday. And uh, I just took the second skin off yesterday, but it like, it's like breathable, like tape, really strong adhesive essentially. And when I took it off, it was pretty well attached <laughs> to this part of my arm and it's like still red from that so yeah that's all that is that's not even any tattoo work done <laughs> and these books i'm gonna go through today i think all of them are from march no there is one that i just finished yesterday that i finished in april but i started in the end of march march was a very very slow reading month for me my mom did visit for a week so that kind of temporarily paused but yeah just generally kind of I think when my mom came to visit I just kind of uh, paused my flow I had going a little bit and that'll happen and that's fine with me I feel like it happens like every spring where the first part of the year like January February I kind of get on a kick and then by about like March April I'm kind of like slowing down a little bit and then it kind of picks back up but I average like five to seven books a month anyway and in March I completed three yeah so let's get into it the first one was a random uh impromptu reread that i picked up simply because roger was picking this up for the first time after me telling him forever to please try this book and the reason he picked it up is because he got an email from the publisher saying that this author was finally coming out with her third book this year and he sent it to me because he knows I love this author. And I was like, what the fuck? Because I've been waiting for this book number three. It's not in a series or anything, but just her third book, uh, Jandy Nelson. And so we got talking about I'll Give You the Sun. And I was like, dude, but you got you got to read I'll Give You the Sun. Because he was wondering if he was going to request that book because the email was like, do you want copies? And I was like, just try it out to see if you like her authorial voice because she does have a very distinct authorial voice between this one and the skies everywhere and so he was like all right i'm gonna start it and i said you know what i'm gonna reread it <laughs> just because why not it's it had been a couple years since i reread it yeah originally read it in 2017 reread 2019 and then and then now so five freaking years ago oh my god time flies um but yeah this is contemporary young adult and the basic setup is we have these twins, Noah and Jude, a boy and a girl, and uh, we are getting dual timelines. We are getting Noah in the past and Jude in like their present time uh, when they're 13, 14 years old, and then like 16, 17 years old. Something happened in their family and it kind of ripped their family apart and it ripped them apart as well. These twins that had this like really special bond their whole lives and they basically don't really even like interact with each other all that much anymore and they're both very artistic in different ways their mother is very artistic their dad isn't and there's just so much in here to sink your teeth into without like spoiling stuff there's it's definitely um partially a queer and coming of age like combo of someone coming of age and realizing mayhaps i am gay and kind of working through that, dealing with that. There is a little bit of like bullying about that. The very opening scene I forgot was like these two boys like bullying Noah about like thinking he's gay and him just, yeah, dealing with that and just being like rebellious teenagers also just kind of getting into some situations. Nothing like crazy, crazy necessarily, but just some little rebellious thing. 
and it's just beautiful. Jandy Nelson's authorial voice is just the most like whimsical. It's not like purple prose, but just, I mean, see all my tabs. And I added a bunch more tabs. Just so much like just whimsical metaphors, imaginative, creative, and just perfectly explains what it is to be a teenager dealing with some of these things and to be like a melodramatic teenager too, as many, te most teenagers are or pre-teenagers too. And there's just so many things that she, the way she writes it, you're just like, I never would have thought to describe it that way, but I know exactly what you're talking about. And to me, that is just like peak excellent writing. Like that is exactly the authorial voice that I love. And it's like so funny. Like this right here, simple line. When the silence between us has just about broken my ears, I turn around to look at her. Like that, that line right there, fantastic. And then this, uh, and it's Noah talking about their dad and like, he kind of like, their dad is a little bit like jock kind of like, you know, guy's guy, whatever. And says, dad puts one hand on either side of the frame, filling the entire doorway, filling the continental United States. <laughs> Crap like that, man, just all over the place. And I didn't even tab every single time because it would be insane. It's the whole book. It's the whole book that is just mm, this delicious authorial voice that I love so much. And I've read it now three times. I still cried in various parts very emotional at times, um, kind of hard hitting bit towards the end. Um, and yeah, I just love it. Still five stars, no questions asked. Not that I thought it would be different. I know that this is a forever favorite. Um, and it's especially like, I don't love young adult contemporary very often. I kind of avoid it anymore because most of the time it just doesn't work for me. Most of the time, the melodrama of the teenagers is like, oh God, okay. It's like, I know it's realistic, but a lot of times the way it's written and the dialogue, it just ugh, it doesn't work for me. I'm, I'm like too old. I'm so far past that. And it just, it needs to be written like this. <laughs> they all need to be written. Every book needs to be written like this, <laughs> in my humble opinion, in my personal opinion. So yeah, five stars, great grand, wonderful, was not expecting anything different. Next, I picked up The Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. And I actually started this in the end of February. This one did take me a while also. This was not a thick bitch, but it took me a little while. This is literary fiction and Emily St. John Mandel wrote Station Eleven, which is a favorite of mine. Uh, I've read that twice and I think five stars, I'm pretty sure five stars both times. And I've heard that, um, oh my God, I just said the fucking name of it. Station Eleven and this one and Sea of Tranquility are all kind of interconnected. And the, after reading this one, I looked further into that. Um, I waited till I was done because I don't want to spoil anything. And I think Sea of Tranquility is like more directly connected to Station Eleven. This one just had a reference. And it's funny because even though it's, I've only read that twice and it's been a minute and it's a very just like kind of casual reference, I think. It's been a minute since I read Station Eleven, but I recognized it immediately and was like, wait, I think that's the like kind of connection. It's a very loose connection, uh, 100%, but yeah, literary fiction and the kind of summary, an exhilarating novel set at the glittering intersection of two seemingly disparate events, a massive Ponzi scheme collapse and the mysterious disappearance of a woman from a ship at sea. So this one, definitely to me deals with some themes of like reality and like what even is reality just in general, but then also per individual person, like just, just lots of kind of talk about that, I guess. Untetheredness, like kind of people just floating through life, which is always like kind of a literary fiction thing to me. And I think that's why a lot of times literary fiction feels just so like, pretentious and like, ooh, I'm so deep to me because that's just not my life experience. Life is an adventure and I feel like I have, I enjoy my life and I have fun with life and I can be spontaneous at times and I'm fine with that or whatever. Um, but like, I don't know, a lot of literary fiction is just like, what if I just like went off the map and never talked to anyone I know ever again and just disappeared into the, 
onto the Italian coast or I don't know, whatever. And like, what does that mean? And crap like that, like that untetheredness thing. And that was very much present here. Um, dealing with addiction kind of in various forms too. Not just like substance abuse, but just addiction. Corruption, absolutely. I mean, mention of a Ponzi scheme here. Uh, love and loyalty and definitely some grief some touching on conversations of grief as well. And overall, I really enjoyed the uh, this book in general, but the first 30% or so dragged forever. Like, I think it took me, what did I, I think I wrote it down. No, I didn't. But the first like 30%, I think took me like two solid weeks, if not like two and a half-ish weeks to get through. Um, and I just don't really know what the point of it was. Uh, it was following this guy named Paul in the beginning. And then his he has a sister, a uh, half-sister named Vincent. And we kind of see Vincent a little bit. And we're dealing with Paul and his, like, he has substance abuse, like, addiction problems. Um, and I just didn't really care for his POV chapters. And then we flipped to mostly following Vincent. We did get some other POVs, but after... It was about the 30% mark. We were in Vincent's POV for the most part. And then I really, really liked it. I really liked Vincent's POV and the rest of the story once we left Paul in the dust. I just, again, I don't really understand what the point of it was. And I'm sure with some, like, deeper reflection and analysis and, like, literary critique, I could come up with something. But while reading it the way that I was reading it and right after I finished the book, I just felt like all of that Paul stuff at the beginning was not really necessary to the story. And yeah, for the characters, Vincent was definitely my favorite character throughout this. Um, and just the most interesting to me. I did also find Claire very interesting, um, who was the daughter of Vincent's rich boyfriend who was running the Ponzi scheme. Um, boyfriend slash husband, they weren't actually married, but they tell everyone they were. That's on the, the synopsis on the back. Um, and yeah, I kind of wish we got some POV of Claire, but we didn't. Jonathan, the boyfriend slash fake husband, um, his POV chapters from prison were pretty interesting too. Kind of watching his like descent into madness a bit, like losing his grip on reality and realizing he was losing his grip on reality and like kind of caring, but also kind of not caring all that much. So the plot overall, I did enjoy. Again, the beginning, I think the pacing was just off to me because I just... I didn't, I didn't connect with that beginning part. The, that, it seemed like we were going to focus on Paul through the whole thing. And I just, yeah, couldn't get much interest. The interconnectedness of everything throughout the plot was interesting, though, like once we got going. And it was unsurprising since I have read Station Eleven a couple of times and that now reading something else from this author, I'm getting a vibe that that seems to be a hallmark uh, for her, um, which I do quite enjoy kind of just different little like connections between things so yeah I did enjoy this if the beginning hadn't been such a slog and felt a little unnecessary I would have rated it even higher I ended up giving it 3.75 stars though I think if the beginning had only been a very brief amount of Paul like maybe the first 10 ish percent was Paul and then we jumped and over to other people and got rid of him um or stopped following him I think I probably would have given it like 4.25-ish, but man, that first part just really dragged ass for me. <laughs> and then the thick bitch that I read in March, Esther Haddon by Michael J. Sullivan. This is the third book in the Rise and Fall series uh, by Michael J. Sullivan, which is one of the many series in the larger like world of Elon by this author, which I am just truly obsessed with. <laughs> so obsessed with. And I buddy read this with Roger. So yeah, we are both like obsessed with this. I got him into this whole world. Yet another person that loves it. Jesse May also loves Legends of the First Empire. And yeah, this was the conclusion here. And as you can see, I tabbed up quite a bit. <laughs> and a lot of this is kind of the Easter eggs the connections to the other books and the other series and everything, and me wanting to like point things out. I have a plan of pretty soon reading through Rhaeria Chronicles. Um, Drumendor is supposed to be coming out. I backed the Kickstarter for that for like the deluxe editions. Um, that's the fifth one in this, this series. 
and I want to read through that and then probably next year I might decide to start it sooner uh, but definitely at least next year at the latest I want to start rereading through the entire world of Elon in chronological order from the beginning of Legends of the First Empire all the way through to Right Your Revelations because there's so much to sink your teeth into here. I'm getting ahead of myself though. The general summary, the man who became known as Esrahaddon is reported to have destroyed the world's greatest empire, but there are those who believe he saved it. Few individuals are as divisive, but all agree on three facts. He was exiled to the wilderness, hunted by a goblin priestess and sentenced to death by a God, all before the age of eight. How he managed to survive and why people continued to fear his name a thousand years later has always been a mystery until now. And rereadability, duh, yes, I will reread this. Um, I will reread this whole series probably several times in my life. I need to put this down. This thing is heavy. My God, it's so fucking heavy. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So for the characters, I am not a particularly character driven reader. If you are familiar with me and my reading taste, you'll know that. But it's obviously like good to love characters. Like the, the goal is to love the plot and the characters and the world building and like all of it. That's the dream. But I can love a book and love a series where I don't really care that much about characters as long as I love the plot and the world building and everything, right? Like I don't have to have the character part to love and write five star or something. But I do tend to love Michael J. Sullivan's characters. I really, really do. For this, for the first half of the book, I was not really loving Esra Haddon, uh, AKA Esra. I was mostly neutral toward him. He was kind of just like, eh, like you're all right, whatever. He was like a teenage boy for the first try, a young boy and then like we jumped forward and he was a teenager. And so I was mostly neutral, but with like moments of annoyance of just like, bro, you're being stupid. He had moments where he was being really arrogant and snarky and not in a fun way at the time like when he was younger it was like it felt like in an insecure little boy way you know which he was and then a couple of moments in his like teenage years and like maybe young adulthood where like kind of some incel ass behavior <laughs> that really rubbed me the wrong way like nothing like crazy i guess he wasn't like harassing someone or anything like that but like imagining a future romantic relationship with a woman who had clearly only ever shown strictly platonic feelings toward him. There was no flirtation happening. He didn't even like try to flirt with her. They were just friends, but in his head, he was like, oh, but she's perfect or whatever. And then when she like goes off to like live her life and not be with him, he like acted so hurt and forlorn and like the love of my life left me. Like he was saying that to people, bro, that's not what happened. Like, that sounds like you were with someone and they just abandoned you. Like, stop. It was just gross. Like, that was a moment where I was like, I need this to, to cease immediately. <laughs> but then he did grow up um, a bit and he matured. And there were moments where he, like, looked back on that type of behavior and realized how immature and stupid he was. So that warmed me to him a bit. Like, he at least had a moment of like, God, I was stupid. It's like, yeah. You fucking were. So that was about like halfway through the book though when I started to like warm up to him more and like him more. And then there's another character, Jerish, um, who at first I felt neutral to annoyed with. Uh, he was very much the set up as like the character trope of the very duty and honor bound soldier slash warrior who like literally only does what he's told and follows everything by the book. And you know, has been told like this is good and right and this is bad and wrong. And that's all I know. And that, that's just what I'm going to follow. And I fucking hate that kind of character. Sweet baby Jesus. I mean, fucking Kale from Throne of Glass. I'm looking at you. And like so many other characters. I just can't. But I also warmed up to him as it went on because he proved that he could like get new information about a topic or a situation or a person and just about the world around him in general and make different deductions and choices and could like see gray area in this like code of honor that he had. Like he wasn't as black and white as he initially was set up to be. And I really loved that. 
So the plot, I was definitely fully engrossed in the plot here. I'm definitely biased <laughs> being a an enormous fan of this world of Elon in general. Um, all the lore and the history we get here to like really sink our teeth into. This book has just so much of that, like so much. Oh my God, it's delicious. The Easter eggs, the connections, putting the pieces together. Um, not all of them, but putting a lot of the pieces together. It was just such a good story of like self-sacrifice and doing the hard things in the moment for the long-term greater good. This is another one where if the beginning had been a little bit different, I would have rated it even higher. <laughs> I got emotional several times. Sometimes I get emotional literally just at the mention of characters from other parts, Mo characters from Legends of the First Empire. Like when we mention, you know, Suri, I, I just, I can't. When we mention Bryn, I cannot. And like at this point in the history, at this point in this world, it's been like 2000 years since Legends of the First Empire events. So like so much of it is lost and they don't know the truth. And you're like, no, that's not what happened. And freaking Malcolm, like any mention of Malcolm, any sign of Malcolm, so next year when I reread, I'm going to take copious notes. I already was taking a fair amount. I have like a family tree of like the gods in this world and several things changed and were added from this book, things we learned. And yeah, I want to basically like make myself a little like world of Elon wiki. There is one, but it's like, I don't know that it's like kept up or anything. And I just want to make like make my own to just have all these notes of everything. Um, it's just, I don't know why I just, it's so fun. I love it so much. But yeah, if the beginning had been a little bit different as far as like how I felt about Ezra, if he, if I had been more neutral and less like annoyed a few times with him, it wasn't, cons I wasn't like constantly annoyed with him, but it was enough. And he was like annoying enough where I was like, Oh God, it's really hard to fucking like you, man. <laughs> Which I think was kind of the point. But as far as like your reading experience, reading, uh, these characters, I was like, ugh. So I ended up giving this 4.5, probably would have been 4.75, maybe even five if I had like loved Ezra or something. But yeah, really great. Great conclusion. Can't wait to get onto the Crown Tower next. Next, I picked up um, a NetGalley eARC I had. I wrote it down as like a DNF. I legit barely started it though. Um, like I didn't even, I don't even think I put it on Storygraph. Yeah, I did not. I need to though, so that it's like the same. I don't even remember what it was. I legit like barely started it. I read like four to 10 pages, I think. And I think it was just like the tone and everything. I was not vibing with it. And I just realized pretty quickly, like, I don't think this is gonna be for me. <laughs> so I just put it down. Chalked it up to a bad choice on NetGalley. Getting, getting too crazy on NetGalley. And then speaking of NetGalley, a NetGalley e-arc, I did actually finish uh, and <laughs> Man, I tell you, these dragon fantasy dragon novels that I keep having on my anticipated releases lists and being so excited for, oh my God. And then wildly disappointed, <laughs> Dragon Rider by Taryn Matharu. Um, very cool cover. There's a different cover I've seen when it was first announced that was much more like kind of honestly like middle grade looking. Um, definitely like young adult looking, but then this one came out. It is technically adult and the general summary here, well, the synopsis here, Jai lives as a royal hostage in the Sabine court ever since his father, Rohan, leader of the steppe folk, led a failed rebellion and was executed by the very emperor Jai now serves. So he's like, yeah, he's a royal hostage. He's like indentured servitude type of thing, whatever. When the emperor's son and heir is betrothed to Princess Erica of the neighboring kingdom, she brings with her a dowry, dragons. Endemic to the northern nation, these powerful beasts come in several forms, but mystery surrounds them. Only their royalty know the secret to soul bonding with these dangerous beasts to draw on their power and strength. This marriage and the alliance that forms will change that forever but conspirators lurk in the shadows and soon the Sabine court is in chaos. With his life in danger, Jai uses the opportunity to escape with a dan dan Dansk, Dansk, that's the other kingdom, handmaiden, Frida, and then adventure and turmoil ensues. And there's soul bonding in this with other animals. It's just this one kingdom, the Dansk 
kingdom, they are the only ones that know how to soul bond with dragons and that like have dragons in their region. But even in where Jai is as like a royal hostage, there are people who can soul bond with like griffins. They have griffins and uh, dire wolves and various things. So rereadability, not something I think I will ever reread. Characters. So I felt like Jai, the main character, was pretty stupid most of the time. And in a way that just really annoyed me. He's very naive. You know, he's since, I think it's since he's like seven years old. He's been like a captive essentially. And like, he just has to be with the old emperor all the time. Like making sure he's okay. He's like a caretaker for this old man. Um, so I get that he's kind of naive, but like a plan would be laid out without spoiling anything. There would be like a plan. Someone would be like, we're doing a plan for whatever reason. And he inevitably always did something to fuck it up. Like, and then he would be like, oh, dang, shoot, it's not going to work. Yeah, bro, because you didn't follow the fucking plan. Like, hello? What? And it wasn't just like once, you know what I mean? It was like uh, several times that this would happen. And he would just be like in the moment fucking up the plan and being like, oh, I'm going to go do this other thing, though. And I'd be like, why? 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 What are we? What are we doing? And Frida, the, like, handmaiden that he goes off with, like, was fine. I didn't feel anything particularly strong toward her either, though. I just didn't really feel engaged with the characters very much at all. Um, Winter, though, there's a little dragon hatchling that we meet uh, that is named Winter and was obviously, like, super cute and fun. Little, little dragon companion. Like, I love a good animal companion. And Winter was really cute. Um, but again, you guys know, I don't have to love characters to get into a book. Plot is a bigger part for me. Uh, but holy crap, the middle part of this slogged for me. Oh my god. I am not the biggest fan of training sequences. And it felt like, if memory serves me, from around like the 30 or 40% mark all the way through to like 80% was just incessant practice with this soul bonding thing. There's like mana that they have inside of them. They have a kernel of mana that they have to like build and grow and feed and replenish. And like you have to soul breathe to do it. And you got to learn how to soul breathe. And like, fine, if you're going to show me that. Like I, I also, those like hard magic systems. I don't really care. I don't need my magic system to be like detailed explanation. I don't. I'm like, just tell me it works. And I'll be like, yeah, cool, sure. But yeah, so it was like, a, you know, I don't, and I don't know. I feel like different people have different definitions of what constitutes hard magic versus soft magic. To me, it's like getting into harder magic when you are like giving me detailed explanation of exactly how the magic works. And like this one was like within the body and what it looks like in the body and this and that and the other thing and these rules and regulations for it. I don't care that much, all right? <laughs> Give me a brief overview. I'm good. Mention it once or twice more. A couple of practice scenes, like, I get it, right? You're Someone's new to this magic. It's a whole thing. you got to learn how to breathe right. And, like, it's like a meditative state they have to get into. Sure, show me. But I'm not kidding. Like, half of the book was incessant scenes of practicing soul breathing and soul bonding and all this, like, training type stuff with this. And, like... During those scenes, like, legitimately nothing else happened. They were just traveling, traveling along their merry way, and showing me over and over again how we practice soul breathing and stuff. And it's just not that interesting to me. Uh, so I really enjoyed most of the beginning, the first, like, 20% of it, with the setup of the politics and the different kingdoms. I was enjoying that part. I still didn't enjoy Jai, the main character, but I was enjoying the plot. And the world building that we were getting set up with and like, yeah, seeing like there's griffins and there's dire wolves and different people and different cultures. And we're learning about that. I really liked that. Um, and then the ending did get some like action going on, at least. Again, Jai was just kind of stupid in a lot of the action, though. But yeah, around the 50 percent mark, I thought about DNFing. Like I wished I could DNF and I could have. You guys know I'm not afraid to DNF, but I had already DNFed a quite a few net galley arcs already this year and I'm trying to keep my ratio at a reasonable spot so I was like I'm gonna finish it like whatever but yeah I was not having a great time also there's like a big secret without spoiling it there's like ooh, big secret about something about someone that was pretty dang obvious immediately <laughs> to me like literally immediately I was like oh 
Methinks that's what's going on here. And I was right. And later when it was like revealed, it seemed like it was supposed to be like a reveal to the reader. And I just did not, did not feel it. Also, the tone of this did read a bit younger to me, which is like fine, whatever. I'm not here to like have disparaging remarks about young adult. But like, yeah, when you are going into an adult book, like you have an expectation of like the tone to a degree, even if it is like more lighthearted or like there's more humor or something, like there's still just a different sort of tone. And this did feel younger other than the fact that we kept talking about dick and balls, especially the first like half, just constantly talking about penises and the, like, describing the look of someone's naked penis, like, in the baths and like all like just why it felt like oh we're super adult here because we're talking about dick and balls and i'm like just mentioning penises over and over again does not an adult tone make in my opinion so i didn't love that either i was like all right i don't mind that we have like a younger tone going on a little bit like whatever but i don't like that it seems like we're trying to like make up for it or like make it adult by just showing dicks. <laughs> so yeah, this one was a bit disappointing, clearly. I ended up giving it 2.5 stars. I thought about 2.75, but that's kind of my like middle of the road, like three stars is like middle of the road. And so 2.75 is like middle of the road, but like a little less. But I like thought severely about DNFing this a few times and like really didn't like the whole middle part at all. So I feel like it's fair to do 2.5. And there we have it. There are the books. Uh, the few that I read in March, finished in March, and then one that I just finished yesterday, but started in March. <laughs> Let me know your thoughts if you have read any of these and what you thought or if any of these sound good or bad now <laughs> that I've talked about them and if you are thinking about picking them up or not, let me know. As always, thank you so much for your time. Hope you all have a wonderful day and I will talk to you later. Bye-bye.